I'm the AI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same, sir. Same mistake I made, Blake, and blame it on AI. First of all, thanks. This is my video update from Moscow, Russia, on this Sunday midday, July 23rd. Let's talk about some news. And right now I am at the park, Bauman, Sad Bauman Park. And I believe this park is named after the Bolshevik revolutionary, Nik Nikolai Bauman, I believe. And uh, the, the whole area that I'm in right now is the Baz Bazmani area. So I believe that's also named after Mr. Bauman. I could be wrong about that, but I, I think that's, that's the story. And so I'm at this, this beautiful neighborhood park. I think this is a pretty typical park in a typical uh, Moscow residential neighborhood. And uh, let's talk about some news. So uh, let's see, Joe Bidenopoulos, Greece's favorite son. He, uh, he had a, a conference, a leadership meeting on artificial intelligence. And as he, he entered the room to address the media, Joe Biden said something along the lines of, if you're if you're looking for Abraham Lincoln, I am the AI or I'm the artificial intelligence of Abe Lincoln or something like that. You guys saw the video intro and, uh, and everyone is, is now talking about how Biden is the AI. I am the AI is the uh, Biden quote, which is probably one of the most accurate descriptions of Joe Biden as being artificial intelligence. And, uh, and this is a kind of a clown world that I'm opening up with because Dmitry Medvedev, he jumped on the, the opportunity to, to dig into Joe Biden and his I am the AI statement. And this is what Dmitry Medvedev tweeted. When you listen to a hit by Green Day from the 2004 album of the same name, it becomes clear what Sleepy Joe meant by saying that he was an AI. <laughs> I can't believe that Medvedev is, first of all, he's calling Joe Biden Sleepy Joe, so he's taking Trump's nickname for Biden, and he's referencing the Green Day album, American Idiot. <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> man, oh, man. Oh, Dmitry Medvedev's social media posts are, are epic. So there's, a, there's an outdoor cinema here, which is really nice. You can see the, the beautiful benches, families with their children, people hanging out, a pizza restaurant right here. I've actually had pizza at this restaurant. It's, it's tasty. Moscow has really, really great restaurants. I mean, just top top uh, restaurants in, in the world, um, right up there, I think, with London and New York and, and all of the, the big mega cities. So anyway, uh, <laughs> that was the Dmitry Medvedev. Uh, oh, Joe Biden, Mr. Bidenopoulos. You, you do entertain us, Biden. You do provide a lot of entertainment. Anyway, let's get to some uh, more serious issues here and let's talk about the grain deal. Let's do an update on the grain deal. The uh, deputy uh, representative to the United Nations, Mr. Poliansky, he, he gave uh, a statement yesterday at, actually let's go this way, at the United Nations. And he talked about the grain deal a bit and he revealed a couple of interesting things which uh, we have talked about on this channel actually. The first thing that he revealed is that the grain deal, the grain corridor and, and the Odessa port and the ships were indeed being used to, uh, to store weapons. He said that they were bringing, bringing weapons into the, into the port. They were storing weapons at the port. They were using the grain, uh, 
the grain corridor as cover. He actually even said that uh, mercenaries were, were hanging out at the, uh, at the port area because they were being protected by the grain deal. So there were uh, mercenaries who were just, you know, hanging around in, in Odessa and they didn't have to fear any type of Russian strikes because you had the protection of the grain deal. So I thought that was, uh, that was an interesting admission from the UN representative, a very, very capable, very smart man. Uh, he gives excellent speeches. Um, another, another excellent uh, diplomat from the Russian foreign ministry, Mr. Dmitry Polyatsky. And um, he also said that, and this was interesting because this is connected to Joseph Borrell's comments yesterday that uh, that was in my video intro. He said that it's actually the European Union that is making money on the uh, grain deal. Well, was making money on the grain deal. So in the video uh, intro from yesterday, you had Joseph Borrell accusing Russia of profiting from the grain deal. And uh, by, by the rising prices of, of wheat, and Borrell said that Russia pulled out of the grain deal, it made the prices rise, and so Russia is able to now sell their, uh, their grain, their wheat at, at high profits. Well, at the UN, the UN representative, he said, no, 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 no. It was the EU that was profiting from the grain deal. And what the EU was doing is that they were getting the cheap uh, grain from uh, Ukraine and they were selling it to, to their own citizens at, at huge profits. They were buying it cheap, putting it in their food, putting it in their ingredients, and uh, this decreased their costs. And then they would sell their, their products at, uh, at big gains. So that was an interesting uh, statement as well. He also, confirmed that most of the uh the grain was was not even heading to to the poorest nations that everyone was being led to believe it was going to but it was indeed going to the european union and the eu uh the eu officials and the eu member states were making big money on the cheap uh ukraine grain so that was an interesting statement as well and then, of course, you had uh, Poland and Bulgaria and various EU member states who, uh, who said, you know, we, we don't want this, this Ukraine grain and this Ukraine food because it's, uh, for lack of a better word, it's, it's toxic, I guess you could say. And um, there's people doing yoga. I don't want to disturb them. don't want to disturb the yoga. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you had Poland and Bulgaria and they're like, you know, we, we don't want this toxic grain. Actually, their farmers, their farmers were very upset because the, the, the cheap Ukraine grain was coming into their countries. And so they stopped the, uh, the import of Ukraine grain. And that's where I think, in my opinion, that's where I think the European Union told Alensky, you know, the, the, the grain profits are, are running out for us. So go ahead and launch an attack against Crimea again and let's get Russia to pull out of the grain deal. I said this in a video a couple of days ago. That's what I think happened. I think once the European Union realized that the profits are gonna, are gonna stop because of say Poland and Bulgaria and Romania saying that they don't want the, the cheap Ukraine uh, grain anymore because of its of, uh, various health reasons then I think the EU is like, okay, this is right its course. The profits now are, uh, are over or are, are going to diminish. So let's just create the, uh, the dynamics for Russia to pull out of the grain deal so that we can blame it on Russia. That's what I think happened. Anyway, there was a, it was an interesting speech at the UN and sticking on the, the topic of grain. Let's, um, let's talk about Elensky's. Well, let's, let's walk this way. Since I'm showing everybody the, uh, the park here, how am I doing on time? Doing really good on time. So we'll be a little quiet as we walk by the, the yoga so we don't disturb them. And we'll talk about Elensky's phone call 
with uh, Mr. Stoltenberg. All right, one sec. Okay, let's, uh, let's talk about Alensky's call with the NATO chief, Mr. Stoltenberg. And uh, in this phone call, Alensky begged Stoltenberg for protection for the uh, grain deal. He wants NATO to get involved and to provide protection for ships to leave Odessa and, uh, and to get the grain to the, uh, I was going to say the world markets or the poorest nations, but we know that's not the case. He wants to sell his grain to Europe. Zelensky wants the, the money, the moolah. <laughs> and, um, and he told Stoltenberg, I want NATO involved. I want NATO in here. I want them to, uh, to protect the, the ships. That was uh, what Alensky was asking NATO for. It's uh, okay. He wants the money. Absolutely. I need uh, Stoltenberg. Uh, you, you come. You protect ships and, uh, and the NATO protect ships. I, I, make, I make much money. And uh, with this money, I buy many homes. So come on. Come on, Stoltenberg, come protect ships. But um, the, uh, the other reason that, uh, that Alensky would like NATO to jump in is not only about the money, it's because he's trying to create the, uh, the scenario where NATO has to confront Russia because Russia has said that any ships that enter these waters, we're going to, uh, to consider them as carrying uh, weapons and arms. And we're going to target them. And so Alensky understands that the only way he can survive this conflict, the only way that Ukraine has a chance at a stalemate, not a victory, at a stalemate, is uh, for NATO to get involved. And so he's looking at this. And the neocons that handle Alensky, they're looking at this as an opportunity to create the scenarios, the dynamics for some sort of confrontation between NATO and Russia. So that was his phone call with Stoltenberg. Stoltenberg, he's going to call the Biden White House and he's going to get his marching orders from the Biden White House. The neocons are going to be like, yes, yes, absolutely, NATO. Go in there and protect the, uh, the grain. And you're going to have other forces in the White House that are going to be like, uh, it's over, guys. We're, we're not winning this conflict. We need to find an acceptable, a politically acceptable off-ramp. And that's where we're going to, uh, to end up. It's going to be another debate and another struggle in the White House to see who wins out as far as NATO's involvement in the grain deal. I think as far as the grain is involved and NATO providing protection, it's not going to happen. I think Stoltenberg is going to, uh, to get the orders from the White House that it's not going to happen. Turkey's not going to to allow it. I believe Turkey will not allow it. They won't let NATO in, even though Turkey is NATO. I think Turkey is going to be against such a thing. You have all kinds of insurance issues. Then, of course, you have the fact that the Russians have demolished the, the port anyway. So, you know, what are you going to load up and or how are you going to load up the, the grain and stuff like that? So I think there's all kinds of, uh, of issues with uh, with using the, the Odessa port going forward. And the Russians, they launched a, a huge uh, military strike uh, in Odessa again yesterday. There's a, there's a debate going on right now about um, a missile that, that hit a church in Odessa. And uh, of course, Ukraine is saying that Russia deliberately hit this church, like the Alensky regime cared about churches before. But uh, now they're saying that Russia hit this church. Um, a lot of evidence is coming out now and showing that this was actually an air defense missile. Once again, uh, Ukraine tried to, tried to knock down the Russian missiles with their air defense. Once again, they, they missed the mark and it looks like an air defense missile landed on, on this church, which has happened on multiple occasions from the Ukraine military. But the Russians, they started to take out more military uh, infrastructure. 
and facilities in Crimea. And actually earlier in the day, yesterday, a uh, Ukraine military drone, it hit um, an oil depot, I think it was an oil depot uh, inside Crimea. So that happened earlier in the day and then the Russians, they, uh, they launched a big strike uh, towards Odessa and they took out military facilities. And, uh, and you know, remember what Shoigu said, that uh, when, uh, when the Ukraine military and the collective West, they hit Russian territory, Russia's going to, to respond to, to those strikes. And the information is that, uh, that uh, the, the Ukraine military continues to, to attempt to hit Odessa with, uh, with the storm shadow uh, Odessa. They continue to, to target Crimea with the storm shadow missiles and... Um, if the storm shadow missiles are, are being used to target uh, Crimea, well, then the Russian military considers that as, as the UK targeting Crimea. So that's the general situation in, uh, in Ukraine, in Crimea, in Odessa. Odessa is really, really becoming a focal point now, isn't it? That tells you something. That definitely tells you something. Uh, three months ago, we weren't talking that much about Odessa, were we? Now Odessa is is uh, the the focal point of uh, of what's going on in this conflict. What else do we have uh, going on? The Washington Post. Since I was talking about storm shadow missiles, UK storm shadow missiles long-range missiles. The Washington Post, they are reporting that the Biden White House has made no decision on attackums. Actually, the Washington Post, even, uh, it even said that attackums are not even being discussed by the, uh, actually, let's, let's walk up this way, are not even being discussed by the Biden White House. They're downplaying the whole uh, discussion about delivering long-range attackums. They're saying the Biden White House isn't even uh, really discussing or considering the issue, which is an interesting revelation from the Washington Post. Once again, the the Sullivan, the Sullivan, say the the campaign arm of. Uh, one sec, I'll be a little quiet. I didn't want to disturb their photo shoot. The, uh, the campaign arm of the, of the Biden White House, which is neocon and neolib, like, you know, uh, Sullivan, these guys who are focused now on Biden getting reelected. With each passing day, they're saying, you know, if, if we continue to escalate and try to provoke Russia into a conflict, it's going to, uh, to derail your reelection, Joe Bidenopolis. That's what they're telling Biden. That's what the Democrats are, uh, are telling Sullivan. You know, don't, time is running out to, to escalate and you're not winning this conflict and the American people, if uh, we bog uh, the U.S. down into a conflict, the American people are going to vote us out. Whether it's Biden, whether it's Newsom, whether it's Harris, the American people, they don't want uh, the U.S. committed to a conflict in Ukraine. It's like the best outdoor, <laughs> outdoor gym I think I've ever seen. Bro, <laughs> man, look at this. <laughs> this is like better than, than my gym <laughs> in Athens. Oh, wow. <laughs> you got the dips. You got the pull-ups. <laughs> you got the bag. You got another dip station. Oh, man. <laughs> you got ping pong. Anyway, uh, yeah, that's, that's the deal with, with uh, the escalation in the United States. With each passing day, the closer we get to elections, I think the more difficult it's going to be for, for Biden to escalate. I mean, the neocons are going to push him hard. They're going to make the argument for escalation, and you're going to have to escalate because it's going to look good if you, if you appear tough towards Russia and if you can uh, defeat Russia as you run for re-election. But... They know that they can't win. Sullivan knows that they have lost, right? He knows that they lost. And so, you know, he's going he's gonna to get pressure from the Democrats to, to figure out a politically acceptable way 
for uh, for some sort of off ramp or for some sort of way to to drag this conflict out at least till after the elections. Look at this, like a full gym. <laughs> it, it is a full gym. So let's uh, let's talk a bit about some tragedy, which uh, has to do with the cluster munitions, and uh, the cluster munitions have claimed the the life of a Ria Novosti journalist, a Russian journalist, who was reporting on the on the conflict and uh, cluster munitions. They hit the area where he was, and it led to his death. Rest in peace. Rest in peace. Rostislav Zuravlev, Zuravlev, Rostislav Zuravlev, rest in peace. He was covering the war as a journalist and the Ukraine military, they sent, they sent cluster munitions into his area. They killed him and they injured three other journalists as well. And uh, this is what's going to happen is you know, Alensky on the one side, Alensky is going to try to pull in NATO because that's all he's got. That's all he's got to try to pull in NATO. And uh, on the other, on the other hand, as I said in a previous video, you're going to see the the Alensky regime turning into some sort of of Ukraine IS. You know, not exactly like IS, but they're going to resort to these types of uh, of activities hitting civilian infrastructure like the Perch Bridge, targeting journalists, targeting politicians, um, stuff like that. You know, and when Alensky was speaking to Stoltenberg, since we we're talking about trying to bring NATO in, he assured Stoltenberg that Ukraine is going to start a, a, a very big offensive very soon. He said that Ukraine has big plans in the big counteroffensive and it's coming up very soon. That's what Alensky told Stoltenberg. Basically, he was telling the NATO uh, chief that uh, we're just now getting started and we've got some really big, uh, big counter offensive plans. Right. You know, that's that's what Alensky told Stoltenberg, if you buy into any of that. So. Should we should we do a clown world? Let's do one more story. I've got one more story and then we can do, uh, do a clown world as well. And uh, I want to talk a bit about who I believe to be the best leader in the European Union. And that is Hungary's Prime Minister Viktor Orban. So Orban gave an interview to the TV station M1. And Orban said some interesting things. He was, he was uh, dropping facts, Orban, perhaps the only EU politician who is, who is dropping facts and telling the truth about the situation. And Orban is not, he doesn't say this from a pro-Russian standpoint. He says this from a pro-Europe standpoint. I mean, Orban is not, you know, cheerleading for Russia to win or Ukraine to win. He wants the war to end. And he wants his country and Europe, not even the European Union, Europe to to survive and not suffer. And so uh, Orban, he just came out and said it in this interview. He said, look, um, in 10 years, I think he said 10 years, France, the UK, Italy, they're going to, uh, to not even be considered wealthy uh, European countries, oh, Greek cafe, Greciski, Greciskoi cafe, Sito. And there you can see the beautiful gold dome of the, uh, of the church. All right. And I can even hear some, some Zorba playing right there. So, so if you're watching this from Greece or Cyprus, come to Moscow to enjoy some Greek food. <laughs> and, uh, and Victor Orban said, yeah, UK, Italy, France, their economies are shattered. They're, they're not going to be considered top 10 uh, 
economies. And he also said that Germany, in 10 years, Germany's gonna, gonna drop out of being a top 10 economy as well. So, interesting statements from Orban. And then what else did Orban say? He said the sanctions aren't working. <laughs> he said this like a million times, but no one's listening to Orban. He's like, the sanctions do not work. He said, Russia's fine. The Russian economy is fine. He said, our economies are a big freaking mess. Our economies are collapsing. Russia's economy is growing. It's not working. So some very interesting emissions from Orban. Uh, Ursula is going to, to ignore Orban's statements. Russia's economy is in tatters, I'm telling you, in tatters. Mr. Orban, you're not listening to me. You're not listening to me, Victor. <laughs> Trust me, Russia is taking microchips out of washing machines. I know this as a fact. <laughs> That's what she's going to tell Orban. Orban's going to be like, oh, brother, <laughs> Ursula, <laughs> she's, she's von der crazy. <laughs> That's what he's going to say. <laughs> He's going to look at Peter Siarto. They're going to be listening to Ursula telling, telling them, but, but Victor, I'm telling you, Russia's economy is in tatters. And Victor Obama is going to look at Peter Siarto and they're going to be like, man, Alex is right. She really is a cuckoo for Cocoa Pops. I'm joking. I'm joking around. Um, so that's the, uh, that's this, the latest statements from Victor Orban. And, uh, and let's do a clown world and we'll wrap this video up. I think we did a nice, a nice tour of the, of the park. That's the area that the kids can buy the little, the little Ferraris, the Ferraris and the Corvettes and drive them around this park. I think this is like a, like a little Detsky. Mir <laughs> type of type of area like children's world children's playground like right i think like right right over here so it's nice anyway let's do a clown world and uh this will be an, an evil clown world we'll call this an evil clown world because i did a a clown world in the beginning so we'll do an evil clown world now to wrap up this video and uh victoria newland heading to south africa one week before the BRICS summit kicks off in South Africa. Tori Newland is going to pay a visit to South Africa. What's the agenda? The agenda is to convince South Africa to move away from BRICS. That's the agenda. So for, for everybody in South Africa, prepare. <laughs> prepare for, <laughs> for evil clown world. Victoria Newland is going to, to make an appearance on your land and, uh, and God be with you, people of South Africa. Our hearts, our hearts, our thoughts, and our prayers are, are with you as, as you have to deal with, with Victoria Newland arriving in your country. Anyway, that's the video, everybody. The Duran.locals.com calm we are on rumble odyssey bitch shoot telegram and rock fin and go to the duran shop 10 percent off use the code good day free assange free pablo gonzalez who is in i believe a polish prison and i don't even know what the charges are well actually the charges are that he was a journalist for uh, for Russia reporting from the Donbass. That's now considered a crime. And of course, free Gonzalo Lira. That's the video, everyone. Have a great Sunday. Take care. <laughs>